Welcome to the HDRO IIEP OFI Joint Series on Multidimensional Poverty coming to you today from meeting room A of the Oxford Department of International Development and available online through the George Washington University in Washington, DC. I'm James Foster, Professor of Economics and International Affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs welcoming you to today's installment of this term's series, which is jointly uh, supported by Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, the Human Development Report Office of the UNDP, and the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, here at the Elliott School. Today's presentation is entitled Belonging in the Digital World which will provide a conceptual framework and a systematic review of the intergenerational impact of social media on belonging in adolescents and older adults. Joining us today to discuss this fascinating topic are Kim Samuel and Prenika Anand of Oxford. And our on the ground moderator today will be Sam McQuillan, also of Oxford. Today's topic advances our understanding of the missing dimensions of poverty, especially in richer countries where poverty manifests itself in non-material dimensions of spiritual poverty, isolation, and hopelessness. In just a moment, I will introduce each of today's speakers, but first, I'd like to thank our sponsors of the series, IIEP at George Washington, OFI at Oxford and the HDRO at the UN for continued support in helping advance our understanding of deprivation and poverty. Last week in a special YouTube Tuesday presentation, former president and Nobel laureate Juan Manuel Santos of Colombia had a marvelous discussion with Tsiring Togdi, the former prime minister of Bhutan on their experiences using MPIs to help lead their countries. Next week, we'll be joined by who knows who. Have a look out, okay? It could be me, it could be someone else. So let me now introduce today's speakers. Kim Samuel is a visiting scholar at OFI where she studies the relationship between social isolation and multidimensional poverty and the link between human belonging and well being. She's also a visiting research fellow at Green Templeton College, exploring the health impacts of social isolation and building reciprocal systems of care. She is founder and chief belonging officer at the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness. She's been a visiting lecturer at Oxford, Harvard, and McGill universities, and was appointed the first ever Fulbright Canada ambassador for diversity and social connectedness. Her newest book is On Belonging, Finding Connection in an Age of Isolation. Dr. Prenika Anand is the Leslie Kirkley Visiting Scholar in the Department of Population Aging at the University of Oxford. She's a health management specialist working on facilitating, facilitating evidence on health behavior modification and its impact on the cost of care. She spent 10 years exploring innovative ways of managing health and workplace well being in India via digital platforms. She has recently completed an MSc in Applied Digital Health at Oxford and is keen to investigate related opportunities with others in the audience. Our moderator, Sam McQuillan, is a doctoral student at the Oxford Department of International Development and research assistant at OFI, where he's worked on survey harmonization and the global MPI. His doctoral work integrates participatory research methods and multidimensional poverty measurement with a focus on the central Appalachian region of the US and is supported by the Beinecke uh, Scholarship Program and the Whitman International Graduate Fellowship. Sam will handle questions on site. Those in the virtual audience, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Now over to you, Sam. Great, thank you so much, James. 
Um, as I get the presentation up, I'd like to just provide a couple opening remarks um, about our paper, because I am joining not only as the discussant, but also as a co-author on this specific paper. And so it's very exciting uh, to be here. Um, I think this is the present, there we are. Um, I do realize that this is a work in progress paper, and it's also a paper that might not um, immediately respond to uh, multidimensional poverty or sort of the methodologies that we typically use since we're doing a systematic review. That being said, I think that everyone in this room can help and can contribute in some way. And so I'd like for us to think of this more as a workshop rather than a final presentation of the paper. I would invite everyone to consider sort of three questions that we'd really appreciate feedback on. Um, the first is this notion of digital belonging and how it builds into uh, multidimensional poverty and its measurement. Um, we would appreciate comments on how everyone sees this fitting conceptually into this framework. Um, and then also how maybe we can think about integrating technology into poverty. Secondly, this paper applies the lens of multidimensionality to a systematic review methodology. And this is based on OFI's past measurement work. Is this something that you find compelling? Do you think that this is really a methodological novelty, or do you think that this is a bit distracting from our ultimate point? Thirdly and finally, we invite everyone to give thoughts on this paper as members of the public and people who use social media. I recognize that not everyone's going to be um, an expert in systematic review, but I suspect most people here will have a Twitter or a Facebook um, and will be able to comment on if they find the results of our, our presentation to be exciting, um, a little terrifying maybe, or maybe optimistic. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Kim Samuel, who will provide the important background information for our paper. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I'd also like to welcome those in the room and those who are joining virtually. Um, and one of those is, um, is Samantha Sammy Bennett, who is uh, the other co-author uh, in, this, in this paper as well. So I especially want to give uh, props uh, to Prenica, to Sam and to Sammy uh, for, uh, for incredible uh, work on this. And to you, James, and to Sabina Alkire, who may be on a plane uh, at the moment, wishes she could be here too. And uh, and to Ofi and to uh, George Washington University and to HGRO. We're really happy to be here this week. I wanted to just give a bit of uh, background as, as to how this topic came came about it really started uh, for me anyway more than 10 years ago oh probably around 15 years ago before Ophi even started and uh, I was invited to come and uh, present a, a paper or be one of the many co-presenters uh, co and it was about uh, multi-dimensional poverty and in particular the dimension of social isolation. Um, a colleague at the time who's now at UNDP, Diego Zavaleta, was covering uh, shame and uh, humiliation. And I noted that my isolated person may not even have the wherewithal to get out and experience shame and humiliation. So that's kind of how, how this uh, started. And then in 2013, which the it seems like not that long ago, but was actually a decade ago. Things sometimes move slowly. Um, I uh, I got to come back here as a, a visiting scholar also to Ophi, really uh, at the time and even now finding it confounding when we have to explain why poverty is multidimensional and how multidimensional poverty findings uh, vary from, from only uh, looking at uh, income poverty. 
but I still came with this idea about social isolation, shame, and humiliation. And Sabina Alkire actually came up with this term of social connectedness. And social connectedness is the missing dimension of multidimensional poverty that we could uh, study and incorporate uh, in various ways to the MPI. And we're still, I would say, in uh, not in the nascent stage in most things, but still in the nascent, nascent stage in terms of measurement. Um, I, uh, I then uh, got to uh, think about belonging really much later, um, giving you a, dec a decade in, in, in a capsule. It's because because social isolation on its own or or loneliness or the what I, I simply term the feeling of sitting all alone at the bottom of a well, uh, which is what that is for me, still doesn't get to the various d dimensions, whether we're looking at multidimensional poverty, which is still my my inspiration for all of this work and to and to be here informs most of it but also to be looking at belonging as, as bringing along other deficits for those who don't have it. So the, uh, the belonging piece came in for me when it became clear that social connectedness was not a standalone concept and, and you could replace your, you could say social exclusion or you could say uh, social isolation or you could say well being on the other side and so on. This is not to offend people who work with their specific definitions. Uh, they're important, but it's really about this realm that I um, I name not because I'm in love with the letter P, but uh, I name as the people part. And I came up with a. Uh, a kind of a, a I guess a, a conceptual way to, to look at that and that's looking at uh, belonging in terms of four different dimensions. One is people, uh, our connection to ourselves and to others. Place, our connection to the places where we live and work and play and what we mean by community. Power, our personal agency and ability to influence and affect change on the systems that govern us. And finally, purpose, our personal sense of why, our connection to something bigger than ourselves. And I'm just giving you the outline uh, here uh, today as to what the four Ps of belonging are. And in the end, my belonging will differ from your belonging and everyone else in this room and online. But the idea is that we can define that for ourselves, but that there are more parameters than, uh, than the connection of one to another that either ground us or don't ground us. And then the big cha challenge will be uh, turning this to Pranika, who is going to uh, really present those four Ps, people, place, power, and purpose, not her, she has her own <laughs> concepts taking this all forward, but, but it's these same questions. And what does this mean in digital spaces? We, we know that we can't, avoid digital spaces, which is not to say that uh, that we would if we could, but sometimes I wish I could because <laughs> because I really um, I really love the value of face-to-face -face connection and and doing doing things together. But we're looking at this today in in a in, in a digital world. So what is connection to people? What is connection to place and then to power and to purpose? You might also be asking, probably in this group, not as uh, not as much as others would ask outside. Why look? Why look at uh, older people and adolescents in in the same uh, in the same study? Well, one of the main reasons I can give you is that uh, scientific research and uh, whether that is anecdotal um, or whether it's looking at numbers continues to find that the two most socially isolated and lonely groups in terms of the, the life course are um, young people where really um, that can be 18 to 25 or it could be adolescents, we're working on adolescents, but also certainly university age, very much so, and older people. Well, the thing about older people is that while we can segment in, in most areas of research, what does what does zero to five look like? You know, what and I'm not saying necessarily in digital spaces. What what does what do these different years look like? With older people, most of the research 
really leaves us off either at 45. Uh, so everyone over 45 is in the same uh, demographic um, or, or 60 and up. And my colleague Prenika will uh, show you that not only is this is a critical area to have uh, better, more reliable research done, um, it's also an imperative um, and a way to look at who do we value in society? When I was uh, interviewing people for my book, one of the people that I got to interview was the chief statistician for Human Rights Watch. And I was asking him for really good data about um, refugees and forced migrants. And he said, well, we don't have it. I said, well, wait a minute, you don't have it, who has it? Because this is one of the main areas that they're working. And, and he said, just let me ask you a question, Kim. Who decides what gets measured? And one of my students at the time, Celine Thomas at McGill University, had the answer. I wish it was me, but it was her. She said instantly, people in power, people in power decide what gets measured. So I want to, uh, before turning it, I guess, over to Pranika and, uh, and my colleagues on the research side, I want to also ask you to consider the values side. What do we value? Who do we value? How do we make decisions, including in digital spaces, as to um, as to what's measured and what's counted, and, uh, and, and really to bring forward the imperative for better data-driven decision-making and policy-making and certainly intergenerational uh, solutions. And I will stop there. The best is yet to come. Thanks. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, from different corners of the world. Um, it's my privilege to be representing uh, uh, Samuel Center for Social Connectedness and um, Oxford Institute of Population Aging, and also bringing forward my learnings uh, from the Department of Primary Care, where I did my MSc in Digital Health, and uh, all the people I've worked with. Uh, with in, with regards to behavior change to kind of uh, arrive at the stage where I'm, I'm starting to look, look at poverty and uh, social connectedness as measures uh, that relate to digital health. So far, the whole area of digital health is being described as applications in delivery of healthcare. Uh, but uh, lately, there has to be a uh, a lot more uh, evidence on talking about technologies as a determinant of health. And in that sense, digital technologies shaping your health and uh, not only delivering your health. Um, with that thought, um, I'd like to turn to an ice-breaking slide. Uh, I always uh, call this an ice-breaking slide because uh, this brings some interesting perspectives in people's minds. And uh, when I showed this to my colleagues, um, and I asked them, what, what, what do you think? And then they said, well, it's the same dress, uh, uh, but also uh, they are a social media generated uh, avatar of the same person, uh, one at 15 years of age, the other at 75. Um, the interesting bit is that person is me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, it also talks a little bit about our topic uh, on the whole intergenerationality and the social media, uh, you know, somewhere in between them. And that's why we're talking about belonging in the digital world. And we've already talked about the topic, uh, the conceptual framework and the systematic review around understanding the impact of social media on these two generations. Um, I just want to make sure these things on the screen are not bothering the audience. Now, uh, we call ourselves the Belonging Lab, and we represent each other not by way of titles, but by the ways of value that we bring in. So um, Kim represents connectedness and the whole belongingness that's infinite. Um, Sam brings in the whole equity around resources and you know, looking at it from the lens of poverty. And you know, a loaf of bread is a very good representation. Samantha talks about and works on nature connectedness and how that deals with, you know, our human well interactions and well-being. And I 
who work with all these wonderful people and, and the intersections that they work on to kind of holistically look at human well-being. Um, and yes, uh, we want to introduce by talking about uh, a lot of literature that went into uh, you know, the systematic review and conceptual framework. Uh, firstly, we understood from a lot of literature, there's a fundamental need for belonging. There are obvious linkages that have been established to public health. Uh, and how the current constructs uh, have played around with different terms and terminologies, but haven't come to a concrete measurement and assessment uh, for belonging, which you know we'll talk about in our conceptual framework and how we want to address that. And then there's there definitely a need for measuring belonging a lot more objectively. Uh, now, when we talk about social media, we all know it's all pervasive in many ways. The stats actually talk about it. More than 50% of the people in the world use social media on a daily basis. Uh, it's no longer a developed world phenomenon. Uh, you would be surprised to know that the average daily time um, on social media is coming from Latin America. The highest number of users on Facebook exist in India. And then you have stats around everyday communication from Africa that makes you believe that social media is a phenomenon. The apps are not related to just Meta, but you have uh, you have uh, apps in China uh, like WeChat that are as massive as platforms, TikTok, and uh, to the to the level that a generation is now being called TikTok generation. Um, so yeah, like I said, there are one million monthly active users across all platforms on Meta, uh, whether it is Instagram, Facebook, or Snapchat. Um, as on Jan 2023, uh, the numbers of users have risen to 59%. Uh, and I'll not talk a lot about the full lot of websites and social networking sites that exist. Um, I want to come to the, the generational approach to social media. Uh, and this is something that has fewer literature around it. The pace of adoption of these technologies across generations have been different. Uh, and there have been terms used like digital natives, people who were born with social media around them, or digital immigrants uh, who had to adapt with this change coming in suddenly. And then you have terms that I'm sure you've heard of, millennials, boomers, and how they deal with, uh, you know, and then the Gen Z and how they deal with social media. Uh, there is significance and value in studying social media use intergenerationally, and that is because they, they relate to social media differentially, and they feel belong differentially. Uh, now, there are a lot of theories around how social media gets adopted and used, and I'll just talk about a few of them that actually focus on the whole poverty uh, theme around it. So you have theories like rich, rich get richer, wherein the people who are more extroverted use social media more and make more interactions online so they get richer. Or the other one is rich get poorer, wherein uh, you know if, if you have uh, many in-person interactions and you switch to social media, you displace your uh, in-person interactions with social media. That's the rich get poorer theory. Similarly, you have everyone gets richer, wherein you know you have your your real world uh, interactions, and then you bolster those with social media interactions. So you know, in, in all, like everybody gets more connections. Uh, and of late, there are more theories around fear of missing out, where uh, you know the rewards that someone else is getting on social media uh, are something that you don't want to miss out on. And internet self disclosure, where it, uh, you know what you might not feel comfortable sharing in person, you feel more comfortable sharing online. So around these theories, there have been many many papers written to you know suggest that adolescents follow a certain pattern, uh, and older adults are different one. But what we kind of try to concise here is you know how do adolescents and older adults generally meet. So when we talk about adolescents, then social connections are deeply embedded in their development, identity, and self-concept. Um, convenient and quick affordances by social media allow them to get this validation that they need at this physiological and psychological stage of change. Uh, they also get a perceived anonymous and safe space. And there is a typical model called the media practice model defined for adolescents which talks about them integrating what they see in media in their everyday identity and the culture around them. When you talk about older adults, then social connections have become even more important due to reasons like 
they're getting retired, they've had a bereavement in their family, there's loss of income, there's decline that we all know about, or there's physical relocation. And the primary intent for older adults becomes to connect with their family and feel that sense of security as they more get more lonelier or feel uh, you know, cognitive or physical decline coming in. But yet they're inhibited by concerns regarding technology, data privacy, and you know, trust around this and their own ability or self-efficacy around this. So these are some dimensions where we understood there's a particular differential need that these two groups have. Where does the literature doesn't help us? Uh, one is causality. It's very inconclusive and inconsistent, wherein we do not know if there's a direct association because the dominant literature is cross-section studies that are of low quality and biased. They're not randomized, so not too experimental. Um, the sampling is small size and purposive, and we know that it leads to a large um, bias in, in these studies. And there's lack of control groups because, again, they're not experimental. The directionality, again, is sometimes there are theories around social media being the cause of isolation than the other way around. So there's two sides of directions. Um, and the measures have been inconsistent and self-reported, which we'll address in our conceptual framework. The generalizability of these findings is um, not applicable because they've been tested on different heterogeneous groups with different kinds of social media applications. And there's no consideration for uh, looking at features like health, disability, um, socioeconomic status. These parameters have not been looked in detail, so it cannot be generalized. Our research aimed at um, the questions were to define belonging in the digital world. How do we define social media technologies? Um, the current evidence um, around this, the differential impact on these two generations and the recommendations at policy level, research level, and technology level. So yeah, I think I'll, uh, I think we've brought to talk about the objectives. Now let's jump straight into the conceptual framework and I'll invite Sam for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just quickly cover how we uh, handled this very, very um, ambitious <laughs> topic. Um, one of the first things that we observed when undertaking a literature review was that many of the, um, especially the experimental studies that have been done, either will focus expressly on loneliness or uh, fear of missing out or these various concepts that we actually conceptualized as interlinking under a bigger framework of belonging. Um, so in order to integrate these, we had to come up with a framework um, by which we could integrate these multidimensionally into our systematic review. Our goal was to look at um, belonging not through a single lens, but rather um, trying to operationalize Samuel's definition uh, that she provides in her recent book on belonging, uh, which is belonging is wholeness. The experience of being at home in ourselves as well as the social, environmental, organizational, and cultural context of our lives. It's the basis for human flourishing. So inspired by Ophi's uh, approach to constructing multidimensional measures, we therefore sought to identify the essential dimensions of digital belonging using th three criteria. Um, this was through a, a scoping literature review. The first is that the dimension intrinsically speaks to this idea of belonging uh, based off of the dimension that we put forth. Um, the second is that the dimension has been conceptualized in some way in social psychology literature, because that's where we will be focusing um, the literature review uh, that's applicable to both of our two populations and it's non-redundant. And thirdly, that there have been some sort of measurement tools that have been developed, um, ultimately tested and used to quantify the dimension and experimental results. Through this process, we identified three distinct dimensions that jointly constitute what we call digital belonging. First of it, which is loneliness. Uh, this captures one's perceived dissatisfaction with personal relationships. And so that's more of the internal aspect, more internal subjective aspects of uh, belonging. Second is social isolation, which represents the frequency of social contact that a person experiences, and that constitutes the external, uh, more objective dimensions of belonging. And thirdly, this, is, this actually came as a bit of a surprise, uh, social anxiety, um, which captures these very acute feelings of worry that may arise from social media use, either from a compulsive need to uh, feel like you have to engage in the platform uh, or because of the content that appears on the platform. Our multidimensional conceptual framework guides our research in two ways. 
Uh, firstly, it expands our systematic review search terms. And so instead of just looking at studies that measure loneliness, that might be quite few, uh, we instead expand it to capture any uh, paper that has any of these three measures. Um, and then secondly, we integrate this into our um, actual analysis to recognize that maybe different populations and within the populations actually, um, belonging can be affected different ways by social media use. And so maybe older populations experience more isolation, but maybe less loneliness as um, by, by using social media. So that might crowd out their relationships. Um, well, maybe youth and adolescents experience more social anxiety and that inhibits their belonging, um, even though they actually engage a lot more because of it. And I'll let uh, Pranika jump back in uh, to tell you a bit more about how this actually happened. Thank you, Sam. You rock. Um... Okay, so um, let's jump straight to what we deploy for methods. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of um, members in our audience know about systematic reviews. Um, for uh, good systematic reviews, we need to have them prosper registered, and the gold standards are Cochrane Review and Prisma Guidance. The databases we used were the Oxford OA database that had Medline, Psych Info, Embase, and Cochrane trials separately. We had a search string that involved synonyms for teenagers, synonyms for older adults, synonyms for the three concepts we talked about in uh, measuring belonging. And we had the whole string of uh, popular social media channels. Uh, for inclusion criteria, we strictly looked at experimental studies, uh, could be case control or you know, pre-post studies, which are quasi-experimental. And then they need to have assessed the impact on social media on change in these measures that Sam talked about. Uh, we used English only for this time, and we looked at full text and abstract available for our screening. Um, from PICO's perspective, which is population intervention, comparator, and outcome, uh, I think population is quite clear. We looked at the definition of 60 years and above, and for adults since 13 to 17. And then for intervention, we have defined the search string, uh, a social media against a comparator, which is absence of social media or absence of um, uh, treatment as usual in some cases. Um, and we conducted, uh, uh, we wanted to include a measurement of changes in these three measures as our outcome. Um, now I'll talk about the results in the table here because the calls or diagrams may not be very legible to read, but overall we had 900 odd um, studies for adolescents and uh, around 1,400 hits for older adults by a detailed screening, deduplication, abstract screening, full screening process. What's interesting is we finally arrived at three final studies for adolescents and seven for older adults. And we were quite curious and we checked the previous systematic reviews. And in fact, this held true for 30 odd systematic reviews that have been done in the area. Um, now let's look at the overview of studies. Uh, I'll try to make it simple and point out the various key findings. Um, largely, there are global representations, I would say, but Africa is entirely missing. Uh, the kind of uh, platforms that have been studied mostly include Facebook, but also Line when it comes to studies in China and Taiwan. Two of the studies actually developed their own social media app uh, and tested it in the older adults. Uh, when we come to adolescents, uh, not enough representation geographically because of the you know count. Uh, but again, Facebook is a dominant uh, platform studied. Um, the next slide really gets into the outcomes. And uh, here I would like to talk about a few key findings. Uh, like Sam mentioned, the loneliness score or universe city of California, Los Angeles scale is dominantly used. Uh, there are studies that have used social behavior, social participation intention scales. Um, and some, one of the studies has actually looked at log files uh, because they had developed the app. So they had access to log files, which you cannot do in, for, for a commercial social media company. Uh, in case of adolescents, distress Social anxiety and true social behavior was studied. Uh, and it is interesting because uh, 
In terms of time duration, the studies on older adults were focused on at least a month to three months, whereas in adolescents, they were largely a day old study and where you had to measure the results within the same day. So the whole comparison comes in the next slide where we talk about you know, all these findings in, in a lot more detail. So when we talk about who has been assessed, then in case of older adults, they had defined a baseline of cognitive abilities um, and they were mostly based in care homes. So that's an interesting finding. Uh, it cannot be generalized to community at large and cannot be generalized to people who do not fit a particular cognitive criteria, criteria which is popularly assessed by the MSME scale. Uh, for adolescents, they looked at school-going adolescents with no prior history of mental health issues, and I can understand this was done to rule out any effects of pre-existing anxiety or depression. The baseline was older adults not exposed to any form of social media, whereas for teens, it was pre-connected or hyper-connected behavior. Um, what tools have been used? So the traditional measures for social isolation, loneliness, social anxiety have been used. It is interesting that these scales were designed to measure in-person interaction than digital interaction, but they have been used repeatedly. Um, and they have been combined with measures for physical health and cognitive because many of the studies looked at isolation in a very multidisciplinary integrated health way, which is great. Uh, the time duration I already mentioned, for adolescents, you'll find the impact was assessed in less than an hour. For older adults, it was assessed over three months. Who is the respondent? Um, so in, in both cases, the people who were using social media were the respondents. Mm -hmm. And just two studies, one each in these two groups, looked at carers or community answering some questions. Um, the quantity of evidence we've already checked checked and looked at the count, but what could be the possible reasons? So I think recruitment is a major reason because uh, in adolescence, you need parental approval or guide, guide you know, your, your, your guardian should approve it. Um, same way, I think recruitment in older adults also has pro one ethical challenges and the follow-ups and the health impact around it, uh, which can be solved for, but I think in this case, it was, uh, it was a concern. Uh, the quality of evidence where we use the ROB2 uh, ROB and ROBIN-I tools uh, and, and the BMG certified, uh, you know, grade tool, we found that the studies in older adults were moderate grade, but in adolescents, because of poor sample sizes, it was low grade. Uh, we break our recommendations down in some you know, buckets. And this, these two slides, the coming ones, will actually take a lot of uh, discussion and food for thought. The first thing is we want to recommend multidimensionality in measurement. That means when you look at someone using social media, you want to look at the quantity of the usage that is a frequency, whether it is average daily hours or average time every time they log in. The quality, are they looking at content around say a motivational speaker or they're looking at something which could be uh, distressing, uh, like a war situation, because passive media, social media, can be fruitful depending on the quality of content. Um, and the perception of interactions specifically designed for digital technologies. Uh, we believe that the tools that we've been using again and again uh, have been meant for in-person interaction and have been found redundant. So there is definitely resource wastage there. Um, in terms of subgroup analysis, we should be looking at differential impact on belonging in terms of various parameters that could affect social media usage. Um, secondary outcomes should definitely involve interactions with family and community to understand and observe the behavior of social media users on their real life interactions and belonging. The quality of exposure, again, it has to be assessed both for active and passive usage, and it should be looked at from the parameters of quantity quality. There should be feature level assessment because all social media apps are now multi-feature. You can call, you can, and in that call, you can audio call, video call, you can post, you can like, you can comment, you can share, you can post a status text update, you can post a picture, and at these complex levels, what's working for belonging and what's actually taking people away from social connectedness is, is to be explored. 
Um, there have to be time, seasonality, and temporality-based studies. You need to look at things that promote instant belonging and features that could long-term, uh, you know, could be helping long-term. For example, you had a, a bad interaction today on Facebook with somebody and it made you feel instantly very anxious. But overall, if I ask you, has social media helped you over the last 10 years? You might say, yeah, I mean, I've been in touch with my school friends, so it's been a long-term thing. So you cannot label social media without looking at these factors. Um, many population subgroups, even within these two uh, groups, ring in excluded, we could not find evidence around people about 80. We could not find evidence around different gender identities. All the studies had their segregation of baseline characteristics into male and female. Um, there was no concentration for sub-level analysis on disability, cognitive, autistic, and other marginalized communities. And the digitally poor, the ones that do not have a smartphone or no internet remain excluded. Um, and lastly, uh, we need persona-based assessment. Uh, how do extroverted people take to social media versus introverted people and many such, uh, you know, psychosocial parameters? Um, and we need to look at, for adolescents especially, um, the levels of social anxiety and their interaction versus healthy, uh, non-anxious adolescents. Uh, so... This slide should actually give some hope because we didn't want to just suggest that um, the research gaps are pointing us nowhere. So, uh, you know, there's, there's no hope. But I think we first looked at the great literature around intergenerational belonging. We found evidence many places. Uh, I'm just talking about two, which is belong.org, which is, you know, more about social care and bringing people together intergenerationally in the UK. And the other one is uh, St. Louis Aged Care in Australia. Uh, we like the title, Ask Gran, Not Google, where, you know, afternoon interactions where school, school adolescents are, are brought in to talk, um, you know, a, a community of grandparents. Uh, and we also wanted to look at, uh, you know, hard evidence. So the benefits of intergenerational wisdom sharing or the Building Community Legacy Together program is a very recent one. They did an RCT on high school youth. And what they found was that after this exercise where the group interacted with older adults on, on advice for life, they found a better sense of purpose and comfort interacting with older people and interest in working again. Uh, another study with Tesla looked at older women and adolescent girls interacting together. And again, there was a, a mutual impact on cognitive performance for the older adults and improvement in pro-social behavior for adolescents. And these are randomized controlled trials. So they've been effective and they are, I'm just quoting three of them. Another study in Italy looked at, you know, older people in care homes and their ties with teenagers. This was a qualitative study and Again, it led to an overall sense of well-being in, in both groups. And uh, promoting interactions for residents living with dementia. Again, uh, we quote here their sense of uh, you know, purpose here, which is a collective based on belonging and shared doing. Uh, we wanted to see if there have been uh, intergenerational digital pathways being explored. And interestingly, we found a systematic review from 2021 that talked about many such pilots and uh, you know, trials. And um, I'm, I'm quoting a few again. Uh, one around let's build our family tree where grandparents and grandchildren use tablets together. Uh, sessions with grandma, fostering indigenous knowledge through video mediated communication. A uh, shared calendar and messaging system, again, shared by these two generations. A uh, multi-generational connection program. This is actually a social media or ICT app that's being used. Uh, and Ticket to Talk, supporting conversation between young people and people with dementia through digital media and many, many more. So it does give us hope that we could look at uh, one, uh, social media companies adopting such pathways till the time we have evidence to uh, you know, help policyholders uh, work on the possible harms and the possible uh, enablers in social media equally. Um, what did we add to our evidence? This summarizes really what we wanted to do. 
what we confirmed was the results concerning the direction and the causality of these two uh, variables um, still lacks consistency and the quality is generally low to moderate. There is wide heterogeneity and generally positive for older adults, but a negative direction for raw sense, but you know, like we said, inconsistent and not reliable. Uh, what does this review add? One, the nature of social media interactions is complex and theories of adoption and exchange are not measured by one dimension. So we set a rationale for multi-dimensional measure of belonging. We need to adapt the existing tools to the digital world. Uh, we need to compare the impact of SMU intergenerationally, which we have done. Uh, we've tried to explain the direction of these effects. Um, most trials on older adults are based on the need for connection. That is zero social media usage as against the need for validation in case of adolescents. Um, and I think I've talked about the other findings on feature level assessment and simultaneous community level assessment and we propose more intergenerational pathways. In conclusion, we would like to talk about three key points. Um, why social media can be useful, again, you know, depending on where the baseline is. If the baseline is uh, social isolation, loneliness, or social anxiety, then it can help improve in basis some studies. Um, but the results are inconsistent. Um, future research should, you know, definitely consider multidimensionality in approach. Um, and the last one, consistent experimental evidence can assist regulatory efforts where social media is detrimental and also promotion and integration to care where it is useful. Yet at the societal and technological level, an intergenerational approach and creation of pathways can be still done. And the specific needs for belonging in adolescents in the digital world can be addressed through such pathways without waiting for more experimental evidence. And with that, I conclude and invite my colleagues again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pranika. Uh, that was excellent. Good job. Um, if I may say so as, as part of the team. But um, I'd like to pass it over to some questions. We're hoping that uh, Samantha Bennett, who's our other co-author, can tune in, but she's having some tech problems. Um, so I will, I think we have one question in the chat, but I'd like to see if there's any in the room beforehand and pressing questions. Yes, yeah, one pressing question. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. And I think, you know, very new topic for me. So maybe my question is a bit basic, but I was wondering, so you mentioned that like multidimensional framework of social anxiety, isolation and loneliness. I was wondering if you have a definition of, you know, good belonging and kind of bad belonging and how you can differentiate between that. Because I was thinking, you know, that I guess the idea is that the lack of, you know, belonging is either caused by these issues or, you know, can be remedied. Um, like belonging can help to eliminate loneliness and isolation. And I was thinking of, especially in the online space, you know, like, Calls and chats and like child grooming and things like that that obviously victims or survivors of that usually say that they were using or like in those groups because of a feeling of belonging or because they felt lonely so I wonder how that fits into this kind of framework that you look at and you know in the framework people would perhaps say that they were lonely and that's why they you know like how that how does good and bad belonging kind of fit into your framework I guess maybe I'll start with the, the overarch, yeah. <laughs> my specialty today, and then and then turn it over to my colleagues. In terms of good and bad belonging, I I would put it just a little bit differently. Is that there is uh, belonging where you have the those deep connections that I talked about in whatever way they they come and that you experience. Them, or you could have, uh, I think, what you're calling bad belonging. Um, I would call the shadow side of belonging, and the shadow side is um, is denied belonging. It looks like it's belonging, but it isn't. And I'll give you an example that I uh, that I often go to, although it's from uh, not not from this this research, but just to give the the definition is that uh, I. Uh, I write about someone that was um, a child soldier and he uh, 
he in three different countries and he talks about how his uh his childhood had no had no family didn't belong so he said he, he found his belonging by being a child soldier uh there were people that cared for him thought he they loved him they did but that what the activity that they were engaged in as child, rex malefe is his name and he's he, his story is amazing were were definitely ones that were very uh, damaging so one of the, the things that i draw about sort of i don't like to i like your question but i wouldn't go to good or to bad be maybe like fulfilling or not fulfilling um is is that when someone else's belonging is denied in order for you to have yours, that is not that is not uh, belonging. And in terms of the uh, the, I guess the, another point that I wanted to bring up is that about belonging, you can also choose not to belong. I think that's really important. There'd be places where somebody might say, well, you're you're part of this group, but we're putting you here, or we're and and there may be a pejorative or negative connotation that goes with that. You can opt out of that too. So choice and agency is really important. Yeah. Um I had a few points, but I wanted to check with Sam if he wants to add. No, I think I mean I, I yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. Great. So I I I think what makes life simple is examples and i think it becomes very important to look at digital spaces in context of what's what could be potentially bad and what would be fulfilling um i think we as a team agree that belonging is an overarching positive concept um but when we look at the dimensions uh they could reflect a positive or a negative concept so you could have friendliness sitting in one of the dimensions or you could have uh, you know, loneliness and social isolation and related depression, anxiety setting in another. Um, and because of these issues of scales measuring either a positive or a negative, uh, they, that doesn't give an overarching picture of belonging. Now, putting an example, uh, if a tool is really asking about the number of social interactions and translating that to social media asking about how many friends do you have on Facebook? How many followers do you have on Instagram? And then we link that to belonging. It's an incomplete picture. But if that tool, that very tool asked about how many friends do you have on Facebook? How many do you interact with at least on a monthly basis? How many do you really get down to a meeting or a coffee with? And how do you feel about this? Now, this is looking at many dimensions. They could be looking at subjective feelings of how you feel about your interactions, the quantity of interactions, and, uh, you know, whether they make you feel more belonged or not say belong, because belong is overarching, but more anxious or less anxious. So if I have to answer your question, if we, if we kind of consider belonging as an overall positive scale, um, but within that, the variables could um, skew its results to negative because of you know uh, the factors that I just talked about, uh, it becomes easier. And I think that's what we've been thinking about on looking at uh, if it's possible to look at social connectedness that way. But I hope I could partially answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, we have another question in the room. Oh, oh two. great. Um, unless you have something you'd like to continue with, of course. No, no, we have a question online, but we, we can handle that out. Um, I was just curious if you, differentiated all between the different social media platforms, especially ones that have different algorithmic incentives, or whether you looked at it as more a passive tool and then just looked at the ways that the people were interacting with those tools? Well, uh, so this did not involve any primary data collection. What we did was we looked at the 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 you know the bunch of studies like I showed right. you and the kind of uh, evidence they collected and their evidence was mixed basis passive media usage or active media usage. And in fact, many of the studies pointed to fact passive active, you know, social media usage being, you know, harmful and active where you you know interact one-on-one -on -one or you send a message and you actually are, you know, interacting with another person without really looking at what their life is all about. That's that's a little more uh, you know, that skews the results to positive. Um, so because we didn't collect any data ourselves, it's a mix of what the evidence is. And we are very, very happy to share, you know, this, this, the kind of studies and, and talk about findings in detail. Yeah. 
Thanks. Um, great presentation. And I'm not sure if this is just going to be a comment or if it's going to turn into a question, but just some of the thinking that it, it prompted um, was that we knew, you know, in a way, I felt like I wasn't surprised that the overall results were mixed because I think with some of these, you know, issues that we already responded to with not really knowing that the nature of the interaction, you know, are, are people, you know, expanding their networks and, and having, you know, hundreds and hundreds of friends, but not really knowing them all that well, or, or are they using platforms to kind of reinforce either existing relationships or to, to build relationships? And so it, it made me think of um, some work by um, Robin Dunbar, who's based, you know, his Dunbar's number. And so, you know, the idea that we sort of have a, a limited capacity for how many really meaningful relationships we form. And so I almost wondered if, um, you know, thinking in terms of that, where he would argue that, you know, you maybe almost have five people who can be like, you're really, really close, you know, really depend on kind of people. And then, you know, maybe up to 15 more, you know, significant uh, other relations. And then you kind of get, you know, out to sort of more acquaintances. And um, his number is about 150 of people that we can really, really, you know, know well enough that if we saw them Kind of out on the street, we want to stop and catch up with them and know them that well. And so, yeah, just the, the, your presentation really prompted me thinking back to how you frame belonging in the four P's. You know, with the with the people. You know, is does it mean that social, you know, digital uh, engagement allows to uh, you know it causes trade offs? You know, so if you're going to spend time getting to know people on social media platforms, does that mean it's going to come at a cost of the in-person development or, you know, or do they reinforce each other? So I, I don't, I don't know if I can really phrase that as a question, but it, I just wondered if in the study that you identified, um, if there was, if any of them gave you any sense of how you might sort of pick at the significance of, of the relationships um, and whether those yeah. crossed over into meaningful in-person relationships or yeah. I guess I think, theory you stand by on, on that. Yeah, I think largely, no one theory can confirm what your social so what social media usage adoption follows in these two groups. Um, the buckets that we showed about where your baseline is. Um, are you a socially anxious um, individual? Um, and in those cases, uh, evidence suggests that social media becomes a safe space to anonymously share and actually grow in your self-efficacy for in-person interactions mm -hmm. and builds your capacity around those things. Um, and and likewise, there's, there's another effect where you know you could have uh, many ongoing in-person interactions that could be completely displaced by social media uh, virtual interactions. Uh, it could be positive or negative. And what we're trying to say is um, the the effect and the impact needs to be assessed from those parameters. Uh, on where do you stand when you start social media usage? And what we did realize was teenagers is actually not the right time to start assessing. I think the right time to start assessing is when they're starting to enter teenage because a lot of teenagers uh, create their accounts you know, before they're even 13. And the, the way the studies shaped for older adults, they had no past social media exposure and they were very objectively, they were able to identify the evidence. But because adolescents were already connected the results did not point in one direction. So um, yeah, that's a learning. And I think to answer it more objectively, it depends on where your first social media interaction was and where you were, and then what's your persona. And it's not really uh, a matter of number of interactions or how you feel, but also your psychosocial constituents, you know, your constitution as an individual. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's fairly complex if I have to say that. <laughs> Um, I know we are nearing very, very quickly the end of our time, um, and I do want to be respectful uh, to our partner at Washington University. Um, so I think this is where we're going to have to end the, the formal presentation, but please do, uh, well, do give one round of applause for our speakers. Please. Um, but also please join us for a conversation afterwards and perhaps an ongoing conversation. I know all three of us are very open to collaboration and just talking through these things. It doesn't have to be anything formal, uh, but thank you so much. I don't know if James has any last words. There we are. Well, hello, good to see everyone. Um, yes, I just have one final last word. It isn't gonna close down the webinar, I just uh, thought I'd continue with a question if it's all right. Uh, 
it's the link between all of this and uh, social capital and external capabilities, um, which likewise has a positive and a negative side. Um, so, and also can be um, seen as being amplified by digital media. So I, I think that that is a really interesting um, substantive discussion that it intersects with, with yours. Um, in any case, I suppose after that, I should bring down the online webinar after a point, but continue, please. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Um, and I, I'll actually, I think I'll comment myself on the question of external capabilities and some of these engine linkages. Um, actually, very recently at the um, Human Development and Capabilities Association conference uh, in Sofia, we had a uh, discussion panel that was all about the intersections between belonging, um, this, this really emerging, I, I consider it very exciting idea, um, the capabilities approach. And I really do think that we need some more literature, some more thinking about it. I don't think either of us have one answer. And I think that's sort of the beauty of this sort of this brand of research. Um, I'd love to be able to get some sort of, I don't know, I don't know what it would look like, but generate some more conversation off the back of uh, what we're able to do. Uh, in Sophia. So I'm not sure if either of you have any other comments. Yeah, good. Um, I think one point we didn't address or talk about a lot was the, the whole disinformation or misinformation information phenomenon that's happening mm -hmm. and the situation the world is in today with two wars ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, social media is um, and the computational algorithms have power uh, to influence and shape your opinion that becomes important when you're an adolescent and you know looking at your identity and and your place within the world also when you're an older adult and you're you know realizing that you're becoming a little isolated and where do you fit in the world for the next years that you have um, and that's something that gives uh, a lot of responsibility to policymakers to look at uh, evidence that's available and I think evidence can become powerful if research is directed in the right direction and with the right uh, measurement tools. Um, and we dealt a lot about that, uh, you know, today. Um, yeah, I think that's where I end. I, I would just um, add about the, the social capital point of it and certainly looking at this in multi-dimensional context is is uh, to your um, I don't know your name but your question <laughs> uh, your question about how uh, how far have we come and how far has the research come I guess mm -hmm. uh, that we're drawing on in identifying uh, what we mean what the, all the different kinds of digital media and and who uses what and why, that's really important. And I would, I think my colleagues would agree is a place for further research. We just don't have it right now. But along with that is the issue of social capital and social equity and, and how do, you know, what is the barrier to entry? And even when you were talking about in terms of older people, that the, the research is almost done entirely in nursing homes, which isn't really giving us a clear picture. And that's a whole other topic about institutionalization in nursing homes. But, uh, but how are people able to access the, uh, the different media and who is helping to show people how, if they are, how do you call it, the... Uh, the, the nascents, the new uh, natives, sorry, yeah, the natives, okay, um, uh, to this. And it makes me come back to the lens of, of poverty and, and for younger people too. And when, when you ask, you know, there's a point of maybe we need to start researching by when does a young person first, uh, what's their first exposure to digital media? that could have a lot to do with what their exposure is to a whole lot of things and 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 what it's and what it would be used for. Excellent. Uh, should we wrap it up there or I think we do have one question. One last question. 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 <laughs> it's to the first question that was asked and um, um, just a curiosity really. Uh, um, you remember that part when you mentioned maybe like I think you were talking about future research possibilities and you made a distinction between the ample framework of belonging, um, how somebody feels 
not so good about the new traction maybe one day, but that's not necessarily how he or she would feel about um, belonging and Facebook in general. Uh, what could be a, um, a good way of measuring that? Or like, how do you, what questions you ask so that you have a sense of the time frame of belonging through yeah. the interaction? Yeah, okay, let me also now try again fit this into an example. Mm -hmm. I'll take you to the world of drug trials and pharma studies. Um, and think of social media as a drug, right? Uh, or a vitamin for that matter, anything, anything chemical. And how usual studies look at effect of drugs is uh, the whole time frame that you've taken the medicine and your and the impact it has on you. And if the question is clearly address this by asking questions specific to related to instant feelings, emotions related to use of any platform within that platform, any feature, and also looking at how long have you been it for and what do you feel about it, and then kind of repeat that. So what, what I think uh, I realize is that we do not treat social media addiction on the same level as drug addiction, and that's a complex topic. But if you just kind of think of the methodology, then we could just adapt how you look at the frameworks around those trials and you give it time, you give time to evidence to evolve. But in the first place, you design your questionnaire to be holistic, to be addressing these parameters. And then you call it a belongingness, digital belonging tool. And it doesn't exist. <laughs> okay, if I could maybe just to, to add the way how you describing whether it's an addiction or a vitamin, however you want to, to look at that. Um, just as a, just as a by the way, which, uh, which I found really interesting. Oh, sometime in the last few months, I was at, um, uh, at, at Harvard University and meeting with uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Rich, who uh, has an, an apologies to Dr. Rich if I get this wrong, digital digital wellness lab. Um, I hope that's correct, but it's looking at at the the younger younger people in particular and their use of uh, social media and and also helping a lot of kids that have gotten addicted to social media. And when he um, was explaining, you know, I said, is this, how do you, how do you handle this addiction? When we were talking about the relationship between addiction and social isolation, full disclosure, it was a different conversation. But what he said is that the way to treat this kind of addiction, he said, it's a little bit more uh, looking at if someone has uh, an eating disorder, because you can't say go cold turkey bad pun, um, I didn't mean that like that, but that you can't say, you know, you can't eat anymore. You have to be able to eat. And yet we're, you know, we're living in, in a world where the pressures are so much, including for social connectivity uh, to be, to be online. So back to complex problems. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I will just uh, finish up with Sammy's questions. Uh, Sammy Bennett, our co-author uh, from the United States, sent a couple questions just you know to get the conversation. And recently graduated. Yes, yeah. recent MPhil graduate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she asks, can you draw some connections from our study to the work of Ophi? How could these threads of multidimensionality be strengthened? And then she also asks, what surprised you most about the findings from the systematic review? Um, and I can I can just give my answer quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, firstly, I think that's it's going to take a lot of effort on the part of a lot of people uh, to take seriously and think about how things like social connectedness um, can be integrated into poverty and poverty measures, um, as well as the human development approach more generally. I referenced that earlier, but I think that's you know that is a frontier of research. I'm hoping our, our paper can speak at least a little bit too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what surprised me most about the findings for the systematic review coming from a non-scientific background was just how little research there is out there about this thing that is so ubiquitous. Like there's so much research on like snails in the Atlantic Ocean, but like something I do every single day, there's 10 papers, 12 Three papers. frogs in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. nothing against three frogs. <laughs> it, it, it sort of gave me thoughts. I think. Um, so yeah, those those are my answers. I would um, 
I like your answers. It's a very collegial team, as you can see. Um, I think it's in, in terms of the work of OFI, uh, some of that we've addressed already in terms of multidimensionality quite a lot, and, and maybe not as much, even though it is where we're coming from, about looking at uh, the relationship and intersectionality with, uh, with poverty in its many different uh, forms. And I think that that might be uh, noteworthy as well. I want to say that the lack of uh, the lack of good data and research, uh, I wasn't as familiar with what uh, what would come in terms of the adolescence, but um, I think as you as you would agree, I mean that the, the lack of research in terms of older people is um, is a huge uh, issue, uh, and in in about every different way and even you know what uh say surprised me or disappointed me um was that here too and here too and so when we talk about older people and of course adolescents but i my work has been more around the older people part of this is that is that we see that it's not that things aren't getting better simply because they're not, they're not getting better because the research isn't being done and the, it is at the, uh, at the Center for, uh, for Population Studies, but largely this is a group, again, what gets measured, who decides that? And, uh, and there hasn't been, I don't think enough really, uh, really good research being done that could drive change and so older people are spoken about as older people mm -hmm. and uh and even uh, recently and um i guess uh, a former prime minister's words came to light about during during uh covid maybe it was a good time uh to to let some of them go um and make space for the others so i think that there's a lot of bias that comes into this and and yeah and in terms of the i'm going to turn to frenic of a Moving along, <laughs> but to ask you um, what I'm saying about about older people um, is this is this is this true of looking at digital media? It seems to be in terms of not not being able to readily find research that is showing the different kinds of digital media uh, that uh, that people yeah. use. Yeah, I think I'll answer the the the, the, the surprises for me from a systematic review perspective. And again, I stitch this back to my medical background. And what I find interesting is one, uh, social media has been largely disruptive in the last 10 years and has existed uh, you know, in a very dominant form for the 20 years, we in the last 20 years, and just grown massively. Uh, but, and there have been studies that have been con conducted, cross-sectional studies, but most, 30 odd systematic reviews talk about methodological rigor lacking, mm -hmm. and there's not been enough action on that. So the, the first shocking thing was for me was the amount of research wastage that has happened. Uh, the second part is when uh, we looked at studies on older adults in a very controlled environment and they gave positive impact, that got us back to the whole narrative that's shaped around social media, that it cannot be beneficial in any form. It cannot help you come out of your cocoon. Mm -hmm. It cannot help you develop as an individual. But at the same time, we all know that you have influencers, you have your own you know, idols who you want to listen to, the podcasts you want to follow. But the narrative in general with social media as a broad term, kind of gives you this whole and that's again propagated by social media again but uh you know it's negative and the positives are not as widely talked about is 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 what you know i think uh was the surprising uh finding so maybe and maybe the direction isn't isn't to look at are you for it or are you against it right but yeah but uh to to look at a look at a way of of how these can come together Yes, and if you if you really want policymakers to do something about the good and the bad, you need evidence, and then that that brings us to methodological rigor, which we need to address first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I'll pass it over to James for some last words. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, and I'm just going to uh, hang it up right now and say thanks so much for joining us today in our uh, and our weekly uh, uh, webinar, and look forward to seeing you sometime in the future. Take care.